Simon Rattle believes that music is our birthright. That should be no surprise to you. Simon Rattle is the principal conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic. What might be a surprise, though, is that, um, well, 95% of all Americans believe that music is part of a comprehensive um, education, and 93% of Americans believe that music should be included in every school in the country. And four out of five Americans believe that music should be mandated for every child in the United States. The fact that the overwhelming majority of Americans believe that music is important doesn't necessarily translate into public policy. For example, the vast majority of Americans believe that climate change is real and dangerous, yet we've not yet instituted policies to substantially address the problem. <laughs> My earliest memories are of sitting alone, unsupervised, in front of the family stereo, listening to Prokofiev and Tchaikovsky, because that's what was in the bin. Technically, I wasn't allowed to operate this thing, but I figured out how to lift delicately the plastic tone arm and to gently drop it onto the vinyl disc while manipulating the volume so as not to disturb anybody in my family. I'd like to think I got away with it. It could be that they saw how much I enjoyed it, how much I enjoyed the technicolor sounds that were coming out of the speakers. I could see the story develop. I could see myself in the story. I became the boy of the music. That's the time in front of those speakers that made me realize how much I loved music and how much I enjoyed um, being a part of it and making it part of my life. And it planted the seed that would develop into a career as a music educator. I've loved the fact that I've taught in this district for 30 years. You can see the results of the work of great educators in this district where the students leave feeling really good about their education and feeling like music and art being a part of their lives is something that they want to continue throughout adulthood. I love the fact that art withdrawal happens to our students. It's a beautiful thing. We've been able to develop comprehensive and outstanding nationally recognized programs in this community because the people in this community want what's best for kids. During our last recession, what's best for kids is what really drove us to do more with less and pull together to try to sustain ourselves during really tough financial times. We really kept what's best for students in the center, but like many places, once finances are extremely scarce, programs begin to be treated differently, starving one to feed another, and that the, what's best for kids sometimes gets squeezed out. Ultimately, in this country, the program that is starved most often in financial rough times is music. And in our district, that was no exception. There was a, a substantial targeted cut to the music program in 2010. Now, music educators in this district were shocked. We were caught flat-footed because we knew that this community felt like, just the re like the rest of the country, that music was important. So we were stunned. We weren't quite sure what to make of it. Well, it wasn't one of those decisions that was made with any animosity. It was made with the idea that music is important, but not essential. So it became the quest of a grassroots organization called Art Speaks to change the paradigm for everyone in this community, that the arts are not just important, the arts are essential. So what we set out to do is to bring the message of 
The arts are part of a comprehensive education, an essential part. And also, the arts provide competitive, competitive edge for students. We took from, we borrowed from the school board goals, the 21st century skills that they believed were very important. And uh, the four C's of communication, collaboration, creative thinking, and critical thinking. Those four areas we felt we could show without any hesitation were nurtured through the arts. We brought in speakers like we did today uh, who had backgrounds in, background in the arts but weren't necessarily making a career of being in the arts to show parents who were nervous about their kids, which you'll hear a little bit later <laughs> from Ellie, are nervous about their kids making a living, don't really want to hear about how the arts are what they want to go into. So we felt we could help people understand that no matter what they chose to do as a profession, that the arts would be helpful to them. So lawyers, a professor from Harvard, uh, an engineer, a Google exec, we brought in people who basically could point to how the arts influenced their thinking and made them have a leg up in their selected area of expertise. We found a lot of information about research on music and the brain from our neighbors at Northwestern University. Nina Krauss, the head of neuroscience department and her team have done extensive research on the impact of music on the brains of children. As the brains are developing, it's easy to see where there are connections being made and where there are no connections being made. And they were able to identify in the brain the pathways that music forged through the brain. One of the most compelling things that they found out is that those kids coming from, a, um, from poverty who maybe had a deficit in spoken word uh, at home, which is statistically what, what they found, when they got to school, they could make up that deficit by getting two years of instrumental music training. After two years, they were able to distinguish spoken word much better, and they were able to function at a much higher level in the classroom. Students who are involved in music are also able to filter out noise that interferes with important information that they're supposed to get in the classroom. Turnaround Arts is a, a program started by the government to address the issues in the lowest performing schools in our country, the bottom 5%. And they target specific schools where they can partner with an artist, go into the schools, and train veteran staff how to infuse the arts into the curriculum to make it more engaging, more relevant, and to help students retain information much better. And of course, you can see on the screen that the statistics from their test taking skills show that they are much more capable as readers and as people um, figuring out math. We've brought in speakers in this very, this very room from Northwestern University and the University of Illinois to talk about the admission process that they go through. So we brought in the assistant director of admissions at both of those schools. And what they told our kids is, if you profile somebody who is perfect score ACT, straight A's in school against a student who's not quite perfect score a ACT, not quite perfect straight A's in school, who's well grounded in the arts, is consistently involved in the arts, they every single time will go for the student with the background in the arts over somebody who has never gotten anything wrong. And the reason they say that is they find that people who are involved in the arts are much more resilient when they get to college and are more likely to stay in college. Art Speaks feels like we've gotten our message out pretty well. You heard Mr. Duker talk the same message. All of our board members feel very strongly that the arts are an essential component of an education. And we feel like this community really still believes and continues to work towards what's best for kids. So we have a moment to think, step back a minute. We're not in crisis. And we're looking at all the testing that our kids are going through and we're wondering, we have assigned 
a value to music and to art and to dance and to drama that are connected to a test score. And maybe we're buying into this whole test rage. And maybe we need to find other avenues to express the value of the arts in a student's education. Maybe what we need to do is think a little bit uh, more about the fact that um, students who are basically taking an AP class as a ticket to a particular future aren't served as well as those who take the coursework leading to the AP class. We start to think that driven by scores is not necessarily the best thing for kids and maybe it's causing them a great deal of stress. Maybe the value of music is beyond all those things we've said and maybe we need to address those. Maybe we need to address the fact that music can connect us to everyone we know, can connect us to the fact that learning can be fun, and connect us to who we are. I know that when I'm working with special needs students in my special needs drumming circle at Turning Point, and I used to do it at Niqua, I had nonverbal students whose only opportunity to create a connection with with an adult happened in that circle because they could initiate it and they could respond to it in a way that they couldn't possibly do it in the classroom. And you can see by the looks on their faces that when that happens, when they can make a connection with their peers and with others through the medium of music, that they're smiling, that it's joyful, that it's productive, and it's meaningful. I know that every time a child engages in music, they are on a journey of going from where they can't to where they can. And that journey is one that students really respond to in a very positive way. They can see the relevance of it and they can see that it makes a difference in their lives. And it makes a difference when they can play with other people. This is an important part of being human. And it's something that's easy to see outside of a testing bubble. When I take students all over the world and I give them an opportunity to perform for audiences that don't speak English, we have no trouble communicating our hearts and our souls to them. And we make, connection, we make connections with each other that we never could if we weren't involved in music. I think every child deserves an opportunity to understand that they are a unique person, that they have needs that are different than other people, that they can be joyful in their learning, that they can actually be connected to everyone in their orbit. And I think probably the most important thing that I hope for our students when they go through a curriculum is that they can imagine a future that they're creating, not one that's created for them. My wife, Lynn, sitting over there, has been a volunteer for in-home senior respite for the last 12 years. And she discovered this magical connection between music and memory. She was going in as the name of the group implies and providing respite time for the 24-7 caregiver for people who were suffering from cognitive impairment. Most often it was Alzheimer's and, and in both these cases that's what it, Alzheimer's disease and that's in both of these cases. So she would provide that time accompanying these individuals, being a companion to these individuals, so the caregiver could be out of the house for three hours once a week. Her first companion was Al, and she found out Al liked jazz. So she brought a boombox. Everybody remember what that is? And she brought a bunch of big band CDs. Because Al couldn't say any words, he was in the latter stages of Alzheimer's. If he went into a different room from wherever he was, he would immediately become confused. And if he went outside, he might be lost forever. So it was absolutely imperative that he was accompanied at all times. So she knew she needed music to pass the time. Well, the minute that she put String of Pearls on, Al started to sing. And he started to scat sing. And he was good. So she went to the next tune, In the Mood. He's really good. She was impressed. 
So she said to Al, you're really good at this. Well, I should be. I used to play jazz. I used to meet my friend Sherman Jack in the city, and we play jazz every weekend. Imagine his wife's surprise when she got home to find out that he lit up and talked about his past because there was never anything from him at any other time. Well, she had her next companion, and she learned from that, Chuck. So she brought the same boom box and found out Chuck liked Hank Williams, and he was in the latter stages of Alzheimer's, just like Al. And so she put Hank Williams on there, and right away, hey, good looking, set him off. And he started singing the words to the Hank Williams tunes. Since she had checked the entire anthology of Hank Williams tunes from the library, they went through the entire anthology. He knew all the tunes. Again, she's really impressed. Because here's a guy who can't tell you what he wants for breakfast. He can't tell you if he's thirsty and needs a drink of water. But he knows all the lyrics to every Hank Williams tunes. That's impressive. And she said that. Chuck, that's impressive. You know all the words. And he said, well, I used to get in my car, roll down all the windows, and drive down Lakeshore Drive. I'd turn the radio up as loud as it would go, and I'd sing along with Hank Williams. That's how I learned all the tunes. Really? So as they packed up, as she, as she packed up and she was ready to leave, she, he said, I'll make a hillbilly out of you yet. So you can imagine in our family, those stories that are 12 years old now, are, you know, that's a lot of fun to have that as part of your family history. Al and Chuck are legendary in our history. And we thought that's unusual. That probably is a rare occurrence. And maybe it's just Lynn is really good with people. She can bring people out of their illness. And well, we found out that's not exactly true. She is a good person, but it's music that brought them out. And we know that if you uh, go to YouTube and you type in Henry responds to music, you'll see a reaction from Henry. The first time he hears jazz coming, going from no response to being able to converse with his caregivers. It literally makes him alive inside, which is the name of a documentary which chronicles the work of Dan Cohen, a social worker who discovered that every single patient of Alzheimer's has a playlist. And if you can tap into that playlist, you can bring them to who they are. Every one of us has a playlist. As a matter of fact, it's remarkable in Alzheimer's patients that when they've been studying the disease, they've found an area that stores musical memory that is the very last area of the brain to die. The very last area. So it's pretty much guaranteed if you're still alive, you have musical memory. Tapping into that is just an amazing thing. I've had a great life that has involved a free education with music at every step of the way. Like Simon Rattle, I believe that music is our birthright. I have been creating a playlist that's exhaustive, extensive, comprehensive, and maybe the only thing sometime in my life that provides an avenue that can reach who I am. Think about what's going to be on your playlist. What music will bring you up and out and back to who you are? Every child deserves to have their birthright honored. Every child deserves music from the moment they enter public school and every step of the way. They need enriched musical experiences because they are building the foundation for the playlists of their lives. And you know that area of the brain? I was talking to some of the brain researchers when I was at Cornell College to do a TED Talk. And I asked them about that. I said, you know, is it true? Because I want to make sure I get my facts right. Is musical memory the last thing to go in Alzheimer's disease? And they said, yes, absolutely. And they said, but there's 
so much we don't know about the brain. We don't know what we don't know. Well, I'm not a brain expert, but let me tell you this. I suspect that Nina Krauss and her crew have stumbled onto something that's much greater than just music, because music is entwined with language. And I think that area in the brain that's preserved for music, we only know that much, but I think we're going to find out that movement and dance, that expressing other emotions than the ones you're feeling through drama, that the ability to visually explain yourself is wrapped up in that same area of the brain. And I think when decision makers in a school system have to make tough decisions, they need to take a cue from our bodies and protect.